So this is a really small to you. Hopefully you're looking at the slides on your devices, which will also make it look small. Family tree of the Cenorhabditis genus. So this is from this year. So it's a relatively updated. They're always finding new species to add to the tree. And it, the, don't focus on the bold. The bold letters don't mean anything in our case. But I want to point out where C. elegans is. C. elegans is right here, sort of in the middle of the tree. And so there are lots of different relationships. Again, remember, phylogenetic tree represents genetic distance. In this case, it's genetic distance. It's similarity between different species. And the closer they are totaling the lengths of the branches that connect to existing species, the more closely related they are. So what are the two most closely related species on this tree, do you think? Shortest branch, shortest total branch length ugh. connecting two species. Yeah, it, so, it, so it could be, Bren, well, let's see, we want short branches. So it's probably Latens Romanii, mm -hmm. that pair, or Nigoni Briggsi, something like that. Neurogensis, and I don't even know how to pronounce This is a new species. All of these are almost species that have been introduced, not introduced, published, described in the last couple of years. I think that's what the bold-faced ones are in this case, where the newest species added to the group. So there are some pairs of species that are really closely related to each other, Latins and Romanii, Nagoni and Briggsy. And then there are some that are very genetically distant, like Cenorhabditis inopinata and C. elegans. Although it showed they are close relatives, they are more genetically different from each other based on the lengths of those terminal branches. It means they are most closely related to all, than all of the other species on this tree, but those two, that pair, is still very genetically distinct from each other. Whereas situations like Latens and Romanii, genetically, they're practically the same organisms. They're just very barely genetically different from each other, if you looked at chromosome sequence. But in this case, these are all what biologists would call good species, meaning that they would adhere to the biological species concept. If you took individuals from the two different species and mated them, they would not be able to have viable fertile offspring. So these are all true, in that sense, biological species. Some of these species can be hybridized. They just don't always produce viable fertile offspring. And that's the sort of thing you would expect of a situation like Latens and Romanii, where they're so genetically similar, you might expect them to be able to mate with each other, recognize each other as members of the same species, and sometimes have kids. In the Nigoni Briggsy pair, which is also, they're also very closely related to each other genetically, Sometimes they can have viable fertile offspring, and sometimes not, depending on who the parent is. So if dad is one species and mom's from the other species, sometimes the cross will work, but not in the opposite cross direction, which is really cool to geneticists to study and figure out why would that happen. The most important thing, though, on this figure is the hermaphrodites. For the purposes of Wednesday's presentation, anyway, the most important thing on this figure. There are three different species shown up here. There are at least three, maybe more, that are hermaphrodites. So these species, Elegans, Tropicalis, and Briggsy, all have the XX sex is hermaphrodite. That is, individuals that have two X chromosomes are hermaphrodites in those three species. In every other species on this tree, as far as anybody knows, which they do, XX individuals would develop like humans do as females. So this is the evolution of a developmental change that we have in some of these species, XX, genetically XX individuals are female. How do we define females and males in biology? How do we define an individual as being from one sex or another if we find an individual of any species in nature? So is it genetics? Is it anatomy? Genetics causing the anatomy. Oh, so genetics does cause the anatomy. But when we go out into nature, biologists don't define 
it's sort of a chicken and the egg question. If you go out into nature and you don't know anything about the genetics of an organism, then, which is true for how biology started, right? Think centuries ago. People still knew that there were males and females, but no one knew anything about, knew anything about chromosomes. So back then, and let's transport ourselves 400 years in the past, how did we decide who was female and who was male? Who makes sperm and who makes eggs? So it's who makes sperm and who makes eggs. What's the important difference between sperm and egg? Because the only reason I ask is because it's kind of obvious, or at least it should be obvious, I think in humans, what a sperm and an egg look like. But the differences are not always as obvious depending on which species you look at. For example, not all sperm are flagellated in every animal species. And of course, then you can talk about plants, which don't have sperm, but they still have male and female sex in subspecies. So there's a more fundamental difference, or distinction rather, between the gametes, and that is how we determine who's, who, how we decide who we call male and female. So you may never have heard this before. I had not until I started teaching here. I, the thought never crossed my mind how to figure out who is female and who is male. The definition is based on a concept called anisogamy. You don't have to remember. But anisogamy. Isogamy is iso means equal, gamete, gamete. So isogamy happens when the two gametes are the same size. Iso, gamete, isogamy. There are very few species that are isogamous in that the sperm and the egg are the same size and look the same. Most species have two different sized gametes, a small one and a big one. That's an isogamy, not same sized gametes. Here, I'll write it for you since everyone's writing notes. Good job. So an isogamy. There at the top. So. Biologists define whoever makes the small and more importantly motile gamete is male. And whoever makes the large, immotile, that is doesn't move around as much, gamete is female. That's how biologists at, at, at the most fundamental level define two sexes. You can do that for plants, you can do that for animals. Any sexual reproducing species. For example, it's pollen that gets released into the air or carried by pollinators, that's the sperm of the plant. It's the mobile version of, it's the mobile gamete. The ovum or the egg stays in one spot and the sperm comes to, or pollen, comes to it. So, to come back to the phylogenetic tree then, we've got two different kind of types of females. We've got female females, XX equals female. Those females only produce what? The obvious answer. The gamete they produce is egg. an egg. Only eggs. And the hermaphrodites in Cenorhabditis are producing both sperm and eggs. Hermaphrodite. That's why it's a combination of the female symbol and the male symbol in one symbol. They're partly female, partly male. There are lots of types of hermaphroditism in nature. And we don't need to go into great detail, but just so you've heard it before, if you haven't since, or if you haven't yet, there are situations of sequential hermaphroditism where, you're, where an organism produces one type of gamete first and then another type of gamete second. Sequential, one after the other. Sperm first and then egg, or egg first and then sperm. And then there are simultaneous hermaphrodites where one individual at the same time in the same body produces both types of gametes at once. It's less common than sequential hermaphroditism. So what's a famous example of sequential hermaphroditism? Have you heard of any? There's a really famous Pixar, I think it's a Pixar movie Fish. about a sequential hermaphrodite Nemo. named Nemo. Clownfish are sequential hermaphrodites. They start off as males, and then at some point in life, they can transition to become females. So all, all clownfish start life as males. So the, in other words, this is always weird. There's probably not, no genetic component of sex determination in clownfish. It doesn't have anything to do with chromosomes in clownfish. It has to do with something about the population they live in. Every fish is born a male. 
and if you, oh, I've got time to go into a little bit of detail. Every fish is born male, and the largest of the males, the very largest male, is the breeding male. And he is the only one that's reproductively mature, producing sperm, and can fertilize female eggs. The largest fish in the group, though, that was the largest male, the largest fish in the population, in the community that these fish live around, sea anemones, like in the movie, the largest fish is the female. There's only one. She produces oocytes, eggs, and then the second largest fish, that is the breeding male, mates with her, and they have offspring, and all the offspring become males. If the largest male dies or disappears or gets eaten, whatever, then the second largest male becomes the largest male, and then he becomes dominant and starts producing sperm and can mate with her mouth or with females. What happens when the female dies? The female. Sequential hermaphroditism. When the female dies or disappears or goes off, then the breeding male grows a little bit more, becomes even larger, and then starts producing eggs instead of sperm, and becomes the female. And then the second largest male becomes the breeding male, and that's how clownfish life works. The California sheephead they do that. And they're yeah. only two birds. So female. Female to male transition. Yeah. When California you, sheephead. And then male disappears, so, so, sex determination and sexual reproduction in fish and in plants is particularly more plastic, that is, susceptible to evolutionary change, than a lot of other species. No one really knows why. There are some hypotheses, but it's just an observation. There's a lot more hermaphroditism in fish and in plants than in most other taxa. I read in National Geographic where they recently Uh, and then there's, then there's parthenogenesis, which we're not talking about, and that may or may not be related. I'm not sure. I haven't heard the Komodo dragon story yet. But then there's parthenogenesis, which is occasionally in the news you'll see the story about the female shark that had been captured as a young shark, and her reproductive since reaching reproductive age had only been in a tank by herself for years at this aquarium, and then all of a sudden there's a baby tank in the shark. You're like, wait a second, how this? Where'd this shark come from? And it was parthenogenesis the female had produced an egg that was able to be fertilized, well, not technically fertilized, the female is only producing oocytes, but there are ways for parthenogens to trigger mitosis in single gametes to duplicate their chromosomes, so diploid again, and then they can start developing. So that's basically hermaphroditism, in that you can have one organism produce offspring by itself without mating. Sometimes in sharks, a lot of reptiles can do that on occasion, at least. I'm kind of confused about the Clownfish, then. Is that like a polyphemism because the environment? Is yes. Ah, so that, that's a great oh. application of vocabulary. I'm glad you're remembering it back to the earlier papers. And yes, so somebody did mention that week that is sex determination a polyphemism? Same genotype, but different phenotypes, depending on circumstance, depending on environment. And yes, it is. Sex, plastic sex determination is like one of the, I looked this up after we talked about that in class and I didn't know what the answer was. I forgot to report back, my apologies. Yes, so the sex change is a, in this case, is a polyphenism, not in the case of Cenorhabditis, but in the case of clownfish. Uh, Dr. Roth, um, in Finding Nemo, should his father become his mother? <laughs> I love it. She's lost. Yeah, I guess when she disappeared then, yeah, Marlin should have been, yeah. <laughs> Maybe we should write to yeah. the producers and say, what the heck are you doing screwing up our <laughs> biological education for our youngsters? Maybe that was too advanced. So we have simultaneous hermaphroditism. There's one species of fish that's a simultaneous hermaphrodite. It has two gonads. One makes sperm and the other one makes eggs at the same time, and it can internally self-fertilize. The only vertebrate species that can self-fertilize. It's a killifish, mangrove killifish. It lives in Florida and the Caribbean. The only known vertebrate that can produce its own offspring. But there are hermaphrodite humans, but they can't functionally mate with themselves. And lots of then there are hermaphrodites of lots of species for that matter. So specifically about Cenorhabditis, then, I'm getting back on 
that was not off topic, but getting back more on topic, these hermaphrodites are sequential hermaphrodites. They're not simultaneous. They first produce sperm, then they produce eggs. And that process is called androdioesy. Dioesy is a term, dioecious organisms die too. Dioecious organisms produce two different types of gametes. Andro means male gamete, andro comes first. Sperm make first, and then organism switches to making the other type of gamete, oocytes. The opposite of this would be, what's the prefix for female? There are many of them. Yeah, yes. The, the opposite is gynodioesy. If, if oocytes are made first and then an organism later makes sperm. So senorabditis are androdioecious. The hermaphrodites make sperm first and then they make oocytes later. And now that I've written all over the important part of the phylogeny, the real point that I'm trying to make here, that was all, that was all point I'm trying to make, I meant to tell you all about all about later, but we'll get to that on the next slide, I think, is the really cool thing about the relationships between these species. What is the relationship between the three hermaphroditic species? If you can qualitatively describe it in words. Are they related to each other? More, less? Is there a pattern? Cialians has hermaphrodites, Tropicalis has hermaphrodites, Briggsy has hermaphrodites, all the rest of these species have they, females and not hermaphrodites. They had a common ancestor where they were into hermaphrodites. So, well, let me see, I guess I better erase some of this. So we can see the backbone of the tree again. Okay, here we go. So, where is the common ancestor of the three different hermaphrodites? We've got Elegans, Tropicalis, they all come back to this point on, on the tree. There's some common ancestor way back generations and generations ago. Right there. So how many different species are there that have females? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten in that group that share that common ancestor. So there are ten female species and there are three hermaphrodite species. So that should tell us something, I think, which is what you're getting at, Parya, about can we guess, can we infer what the ancestor looked like in terms of sexual reproduction based on the information we have on the current species? Was the ancestor a female, male, female species or a male hermaphrodite species? Male, female. So why would you argue that? Male, female. What's the rationale? I, I agree. Okay. If that helps, the way the tree is. So we've got. Yeah, it's the shape of the tree. It's the distribution of these traits, the hermaphrodite, hermaphrodite traits. It's more likely that three got something different than all um, ten losing something. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is the evolutionary principle of parsimony that the fewest number of changes necessary to explain a pattern is the most likely explanation. It's Occam's razor, if you've heard of Occam's razor before, the simplest explanation is the most likely one. Same as parsimony. Parsimony. So that means it's more likely that the ancestor was a, herma a female species, rather, and that on the branches that led to, during time, in evolution, hermaphroditism evolved three different times. 
So it would, be, it would not be surprising if you found three close relatives being hermaphrodite. For example, down here at the bottom of the tree, we've got Cenorhabditis sinica, Zanzibari, and Tribulatin, ah, Tribulationonis. I can't even say it. Right? If those, those three are all there, each their closest relatives, so if those three were all hermaphrodites, that would kind of make sense. It would suggest that there was one mutation or more, maybe here, in a common ancestor to those three species, but to none other. You could get a mutation there. That would explain why they would all have that same trait. It's kind of like thinking about mammals. We all have hair. It's a defining trait of mammals. It's because the ancestor of all mammals had mutation or mutations at that point in time in the ancestor of all mammals that made them develop hair. That's why we all have hair. It's called a synapomorphy, if you really want. This is vocabulary heavy. I like it. <laughs> Phylogenetics, synapomorphy. It's a trait that's shared among all of the members of a group. So what this means for these three species of hermaphrodites, then, is most critically what? They're not they're each other's closest relatives. So hermaphroditism evolved three different times in this group of worms, in one genus. So, for example, on the branch leading to C. elegans, there must have been a mutation X, we'll call it X1, something evolved in that branch specifically because C. interpenata has females. So we know that the mutation that causes hermaphroditism, mutation or mutations, whatever changes, cause hermaphroditism didn't occur in their ancestor. It occurred specifically on the branch that's unique to C. elegans. And the same is true of these other sister pairs, where one is a male-female species and one is a male hermaphrodite, a gynodioecious species. So Tropicalis evolved mutation X for a change, two. And then in C. briggsi, sister species of C. nagoni, there would be a third evolution of hermaphroditism. And the more people find Cenorhabditis nematodes, the more frequently they find hermaphrodites. So this might not be the only three in the species that are male hermaphrodite species. They're male, yeah, male hermaphrodite species. So this is, as we discussed in the first one or two class meetings, the quintessential natural experiment that gets Evo Devoists really excited because we've had the same trait the same developmental trait, the development of what sorts of gametes you produce, evolved three different times in really closely related species, which lets us ask what sorts of really interesting, to, to Evo Devo people anyway, what sorts of questions. Is there more than one gene responsible? Okay, so how many genes, how many different mutations does it take to get to the center of a tutsi? No. How many, for those of you who know the commercial, how many different mutations does it take to make a female a hermaphrodite? The other question is, is it the same mutations in the three different species? Or does evolution find different mutations, different, or the same mutations but in different genes, to arrive at the same trait? So the trait is an organism that makes both sperm and eggs. But there might be many ways for evolution, for mutation, to solve that problem, to achieve that goal. Not that evolution has a goal in mind. Evolution is neutral. Change happens. It could be good or bad. So those are questions that are really of interest. How many mutations does it take? What sorts of genes? And is it the same mutations in the three different species that allow each of them to evolve female bodies that also become able to make sperm? And that is exact in Cenorhabditis XX organisms. So this figure is from Worm Atlas. I didn't put a citation on there, which is why I had to say it. And there are distinct sexes. They're different in size. Their gonads have different shapes. So in the hermaphrodite, and by the way, you could replace, well, we'll do that later. This is hermaphrodite. This is how hermaphroditism works. It's got two different gonad arms, they call them. Two different gonads. You can think of paired ovaries in females in humans. It's got paired gonads as well. They just go from the middle of the body forward toward the head. It's basically a long tube towards the uterus, which is this region, and then the vulva. 
that opens to the exterior of the worm. So there are two gonad arms. Here's the other one. Starts there along the back of the worm, goes this direction, bends, and winds up in the uterus here in the vulva. The way hermaphroditism works in Cenorhabditis is there's a single, single, sorry, single stem cell at the end, or the beginning, depending on how you look at it, of the gonad. And so those stem cells in blue divide, and the daughter cells that they produce, there's, so in stem cell division, the stem cell divides and produces a daughter cell. The stem cell retains its stemness, which means it's able to produce cells of different types. So the stem cell stays there, but its daughter cells, the cells that it produces after cell division, become gametes. And the gametes physically get pushed or move down this tube, the ovary, and as they move down the ovary, they go through meiosis. So they go through the process of becoming mature, whatever, sperm or oocyte, depending on what time of the year it is, or what time of the worm's life it is. So the first maybe 300 or so times that stem cell divides each of them separately, the first 300 or so times they divide, the daughter cells become sperm. So that's androdioesi. First makes sperm. And then at some point during the late larval stage of these worms, right before they become reproductive adults, then that stem cell just all of a sudden has something switches, something changes, and the very next daughter cell it produces becomes an oocyte. So it's sperm, 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 oocyte, oocyte, oocyte. There's never, at least as far as people can tell, there are never any intersexual, like confused gametes. Like, I don't know if I'm supposed to be a sperm or an oocyte in the, at the interface. It's sperm once, and then the very next one, at some point in the development of the worm, yep, now we're making oocytes. OK. So as the sperm mature and move down the gonad, they find themselves in a spot that's comfortable for them to live, I guess, called the spermatheca, sperm room in Latin. And they just hang out there in the spermatheca. <laughs> and then as those oocytes start to be formed by this stem cell, they also move down. And that's what's shown here is these larger cells, the lines separating this are the cell membranes and those little round dots, the O's in them are the nucleus. You can actually see under a microscope. So those are maturing oocytes. They're way bigger than the sperm, which is typical for organisms that produce small sperm. And by definition, the sperm are the small ones, the oocytes are the large ones. And so in a hermaphrodite then, she's produced all of the sperm she's ever going to make early in her life. Sperm first, then makes oocytes for the rest of her life. So as the oocytes travel down the ovary, the oodoct, this, these oocytes are basically literally shoved into the spermatheca. They ovulate into the spermatheca, where they run into this whole pool of sperm, so the oocytes can't help but be fertilized. So worm sperm are not flagellated. They don't really have to move. They're kind of, eh, sit there. The oocytes come to them. They do have to move a little bit, because when the oocyte moves through the sperm spermatheca, it shoves all of the sperm into the uterus, and the sperm all have to crawl back into the spermatheca or else they risk getting pushed out of the uterus through the vulva when the embryos are deposited late. So the sperm are modal. They crawl. They don't, they're not flagellated. They have a pseudopod, so they extend part of their cell membrane, grab onto the surface, and pull themselves along. So they do move, and they're smaller than the oocytes. And then at some point, those stem cells stop producing cells, and the worm becomes sterile. It's done producing offspring becomes an old worm. And males, they exist. They just make sperm. All their whole life, they go around mating with hermaphrodites. And depending on the species, they either go around mating with hermaphrodites or they mate with females. And the sperm that males can ejaculate into the uterus of a hermaphrodite then crawl into the spermatheca and they mix with self-sperm. So you've got self-sperm mixed with, mate, with male sperm sometimes if there are males around. Otherwise, the hermaphrodites are just selfing. They're just self-fertilizing, producing genetically identical clones of themselves because it's their own sperm and eggs that are fusing. So crossing can happen. 
in hermaphrodite species, males and hermaphrodites can mate with each other and make offspring, but hermaphrodites can also self. And this supposedly is a good thing because if you're a hermaphrodite, then what's the benefit? There's always, there's always a pro and a con for anything that evolves. There's always something good and something bad. There's always a trade-off. So what's useful about being a hermaphrodite? Guaranteed. I mean, none of you know, probably, but... You're guaranteed to advance the species. Hey, super fit, because you never have to find a mate. You just make offspring. You don't have to go through all of the energy that it takes to court a mate, mate with a mate, defend your... Well, you still have to... These worms don't defend their offspring. But, yeah, none of the energetics related to mating has to happen. The bad thing would be inbreeding. Right. So... The bad thing about selfing is inbreeding, like you're not supposed to marry your cousin because if you get too many similar chromosomes, then that usually is bad, inbreeding depression. But, the, so that is the bad thing. The good news is that in the organisms that evolved selfing, they exist. So they got through whatever rough patch it was in their evolutionary history when there was a lot of inbreeding depression and the worms were really sick. But if you can survive long enough, if your lineage, generation after generation, can survive long enough, then you get through that part, then you're okay. And then you've got this great adaptation. You don't have to find a mate. You can just make lots of yourself. So there are two differences between females and hermaphrodites. And one of the reasons that some scientists think it's pretty easy for senior abditis to evolve hermaphroditism is because look at the XX hermaphrodite. A female looks exactly the same. In fact, let me just show you what a female looks like. We're going to cross out the word hermaphrodite. Females are also XX, so there's no chromosomal changes that have to happen to make a hermaphrodite. So XX female. Let's see, the body is identical. So a female looks just like this. The only difference is, there. Doesn't make sperm. That's the only difference, as far as anybody could tell, just anatomically between a female and a hermaphrodite. Hermaphrodite makes sperm and then it makes oocytes. The female never makes sperm, but the body, the somatic structures, the tissues, everything other than the gonad, are identical. Females look just like this. They've got a bilobed pair of ovaries. They've got two stem cells. The stem cells never make sperm. They just always make oocytes. The oocytes travel down the oviduct. They mature. They get ovulated into the uterus where they get fertilized by male sperm that have been ejaculated into the uterus and crawled into the spermatheca. So the females already have spermatheca. They already have all the anatomy for being hermaphrodites. The main difference is the female gonad just doesn't know how to make sperm. So it's probably pretty easy for senior abditis nematodes to evolve selfing because the anatomy is already set up for selfing. You just have to figure out how to get an ovary, or sorry, to get the stem cell to produce sperm, and then stop making sperm and start making oocytes, which is a big request, I think. And so that's what this paper we're going to read is all about, is what are the types of mutations, how many are there that can make a female become a functional hermaphrodite? So just to prove the point, although this is not actually the movie, you can come, you can Google this if you want on, I think, Worm Atlas. There's a section for movies, so if you go to wormatlas.org and you flip around a little bit, you'll find some movies like the movie of a male mating with a hermaphrodite. But this would be exactly the same if this was a male-female species. The hermaphrodite would look exactly the same, the male would look exactly the same. That's the right size. Males are much smaller than the hermaphrodites in these species. It's just that this worm had produced her own sperm before she started making oocytes. If this was a male-female species, the male would still mate with a female, but that would be the only way to get offspring, is if males mate with females. Yeah, so a little bit more about mating. This is a micrograph, a photograph of the gonad. 
this is the end of that gonad where that distal tip cell, the stem cell sits. And then all of these are maturing cells, and you can maybe see if you can tell. They get bigger over time. And then all of these big cells, the, the dimples in the middle are the uh, nucleus. So these big cells are maturing oocytes. And then they reach, there's a little barrier here that the oocytes get ovulated through into the spermatheca. You can't see the sperm, they're too small. And then everything in the uterus of the worm, which is this bit, are fertilized oocytes. They're developing embryos. So that one, eh, you can kind of tell, kind of looks like a yin-yang. There's like a wavy cell, cell membrane starting to form between that's two nuclei, so that's a two-cell embryo. That one's maybe a four-cell embryo. They're eventually going to be pushed out of the uterus through the vulva onto the plate, out of the female body, and then the embryos hatch become free crawling larvae. The point to make here is that you have to, with, the oocytes don't normally ovulate, get pushed out of the gonad into the uterus, unless there are sperm there, because sperm make chemical cues that stimulate ovulation. So when the hermaphrodite, this is from a hermaphrodite, when the hermaphrodite starts running out of her own sperm, because she only makes a finite amount, because she made sperm first and then she makes oocytes. So when she starts running low on her own sperm, then she starts ovulating less frequently. And then when you get a hermaphrodite that has run out of its own sperm, those nice big fat square oocytes start to pile up and compress against each other in the gonad and they make this stacking oocytes phenotype. So each of these is an oocyte. They're not being ovulated, so they're just kind of all piling up together inside the gonad, not being ovulated. And every once in a while, one like potato-shaped smushy thing gets shoved into the uterus, not fertilized, and then eventually the hermaphrodite might deposit it on the plate, but it's not a viable embryo. So hermaphrodites make around 180 to 250 sperm. They can have about that many self-offspring, and then they run out of sperm, and then they look like that. So sperm are essential for... This is also an example of a mutant. So you can find genetic mutants in C. elegans, C. briggsi, in any of the hermaphrodite species. You can isolate mutants that never make sperm. So they look like this all the time. They never have any offspring because they don't make their own sperm. That's how they find them. It's pretty easy to find a single worm that doesn't make any offspring. You put it on a plate by itself and it never makes offspring. You say, it's a hermaphrodite. Why isn't it making offspring? Then you know you found a worm that has a mutation in a gene or more genes that made it not produce sperm in the first place. And that's a great tool for figuring out what are the genes that are responsible for making, allowing these worms to make sperm. You find hermaphrodites that can't, and then you figure out what's different genetically about them than the hermaphrodites that can make their own sperm. You identify the mutations that make this phenotype. No sperm. On the other hand, population. So that was an example of there are also mutants that you can isolate in Cenorhabditis that don't make oocytes. These are hermaphrodite species, but you can find hermaphrodites. There's still a vulva there. There's still a uterus. But the gonad is not full of oocytes. These are all sperm. So a hermaphrodite can only make sperm and never makes any oocytes. Another great tool for studying the evolution of development. What are the genes that underlie the ability for these worms to make either sperm or eggs or neither? Any questions? Yeah. If you have hermaphrodites with mixed with males, is it prepared to self-fertilize or to Ah, good question. So yeah, if you if you have a hermaphrodite species that can self and it can cross mate with males, yeah. cross offspring are better than self offspring. It turns out. The reason for that likely is that these hermaphrodite species, the male sperm or the sorry the self sperm that the hermaphrodite produces. They don't have to do anything. They just sit in the spermatheca and wait for oocytes to come to them. They do have to crawl back into the spermatheca after ovulation, but that's not much. So over time, 
the genes that allow sperm to be stronger, bigger, faster, competitive, have been mutated and lost. So in other words, the selfing species, their sperm are kind of lazy. And so male sperm, on the other hand, are bigger and faster than hermaphrodite self-sperm. So if you had a selfing hermaphrodite that was also mated with a male, the male sperm would be used first. They would get to the oocytes first because they're bigger and faster. So the, first, the next offspring that would come out of that hermaphrodite would be cross offspring, but then as soon as the male sperm was used up, then the hermaphrodite would be using her, the rest of her self sperm again. So can you get a spermless hermaphrodite to have kids yes. forms with a male? Right, that's the only way. So these, these eggless hermaphrodites, the ones that produce only sperm, these are really hard strains to work with because hermaphrodites don't have the ability to move their sperm into another organism. They're, they've got female bodies. They don't, they're not the ejaculators. So they have no way to get the sperm out of their gonad into another organism. So it's hard to keep these strains around in the laboratory because how do you get more of these worms? They can't mate, so they can't have kids. The spermless hermaphrodites, on the other hand, they just, they're female bodies that don't make sperm. They just make oocytes. Yeah. You just add a male, you get progeny. Would their offspring be hermaphrodites as well, or would they, like, the, of, the, of the spermless hermaphrodites? Oh, of the spermless hermaphrodites? Yeah, if they, like, crossed with a male, would, would their offspring be hermaphrodites as well, or would they be just females? I should know the answer to that question. That's a really good question. I believe that because they're mutants, that all the offspring would be, again, the spermless hermaphrodites. But they'll produce some male offspring, too, and those ones, that's what I'm trying to remember. The hermaphrodites would definitely, again, be she, spermless hermaphrodites, but I don't remember what the males do in the case where you have male offspring from the spermless hermaphrodite. I will look that up. I really should know that. Can they be spermless males? You can make spermless males, but again, that's a hard strain to propagate because then they can't make offspring. That's the really hard thing about working with sex determination and studying how it evolves because there are a lot of things that you can do with other species, with other systems, like bone development, like we saw in the mice, for example. You can't really make so many mutants in sex determination because if you screw it up too much, then you don't get any offspring. Image of warm sperm, not flagellated. These are not, oh, these are not activated either. So warm sperm have to be mixed with seminal fluid to turn them on. When, when the male body produces them, they just sit in the male seminal vesicle until ejaculation when the sperm are mixed with seminal fluid. And something about the seminal fluid makes these kind of weird angular, almost dead looking. If you've ever worked with tissue culture, these do not look like happy cells. They just, they're sperm that haven't been activated yet, but once they get activated ejaculation, then they turn into modal sperm and they can crawl around. So, last little bits of background. The genetic pathway that controls meiosis, or germline sex determination. So this long list of genes is what's known so far about the genes that are responsible in, for, in a hermaphrodite determining whether or not oogenesis is happening or spermatogenesis is happening. So there is a little bit known about, this, about the genes that switch the gonad from making sperm to making oocytes. And this is a classic example of a repression cascade because all of these arrows between the genes, HER1, TRA2, and TRA3, the FEMS, TRA1, the FOGs, these are all blunt arrows. It's a repression cascade. So let's start, in this case, to understand the logic. It makes sense to start down here. Worms that have these two genes turned on, FOG1 and FOG3, those genes, the proteins that they produce together, activate spermatogenesis. At the same time, those two genes, well, if you're having spermatogenesis, you don't want oogenesis. So those two genes together block oogenesis, while at the same time they turn on spermatogenesis. But you don't want to have spermatogenesis all the time. So how do you turn the FOG genes off? 
That's the job of TRA1, which is another protein. So when, it's being, when this protein is being produced, it represses those. So if those two aren't there, then it, they can't block oogenesis, and they can't turn on spermatogenesis, so you get the opposite. So when TRA1 is active, it gets rid of those two, so you get oogenesis and not spermatogenesis. But if you work one step back, the FEMS turn off TRA, which turn off the FOGs, which turn off oogenesis. So when these genes are active, when those proteins are produced, then that's disabled, so those are enabled, so you get spermatogenesis and not oogenesis. But when you get the TRAs turned on, <laughs> and so forth. So it's this repression cascade, things turning off things that turn off things that turn off things that turn off things that eventually impinge on the final gatekeepers. Are the FOGs, FOG1 and FOG3 on spermatogenesis, or are they off? By default, you might consider you get oogenesis. So it's a brief period of time in the body of a hermaphrodite when those two genes, FOG1 and FOG3, are on. Briefly making spermatogenesis and then they get turned off. There are two reasons for you to know this information. You don't know it yet, to have heard this information. One is that this paper is going to talk a lot about several members of this pathway, so it makes sense to have seen it once and to understand a little bit the logic of how this pathway works. The other reason to know about this is because. There are, of course, not of course, there are differences in how C. briggsi and C. elegans regulate germline sex determination. This is the C. elegans figure. The C. briggsi version looks slightly different. So here's the same figure from C. elegans on top. Here's the figure, same pathway, this time just looking at spermatogenesis, but the same, same, right? It's the fog genes activating spermatogenesis in both species. But there's an important difference here. So we still have, in both cases, HER1 represses TRA2, which represses the FEMS, which represses TRA1, which represses the FOGS, which turns on spermatogenesis. What's the difference between these two pathways? Right, so we've got in C. elegans and C. briggsi, there are different genes that repress TRA2. So this was the first clue that led up to what we're going to read on Wednesday, that there's something that is an answer to the question we asked at the start of class. Did hermaphroditism evolve using the same mutations and changes, or was it different? So this was the first example that we knew of, that there was a genetic difference between how C. elegans and C. briggsi regulate sex determination, the production of gametes. Same, the core pathway is the same, but there are genetic differences. Because in C. briggsi, there's a gene called SHE1 that produces a protein that represses TRA2. The weird thing is, C. elegans does not have this gene. This is a novel gene that's only found in C. briggsi. So C. briggsi evolved this gene separately from C. elegans, and that gene does the same function as GOLD1 and FOG2 do to repress TRA2 in another species. So it's really interesting. The two different species, C. elegans and C. briggsi, both evolved hermaphroditism, and at least part of that process was each of those species separately came up with different newly evolved genes, not the same gene, not orthologs, not the same gene in different species, totally different, novel, newly evolved genes, but those genes both interact with this core conserved pathway at the same point. Both of those genes regulate whether or not TRA2 or TRA2 and TRA3 are active. And this is why a lot of people, this is when people got really excited about studying the evolution of hermaphroditism in C. rhabditis, because it seemed like we were going to see multiple independent ways to become hermaphrodite in lots of different, at least three species. Definitely these two species.
So what do you think about this question? You were going to study how hermaphroditism evolved. Which species would you pick to study? This is a fundamental question in most sciences, not even just biology, not, especially not just evo-devo. You've got to pick a subject to work on, a system. Sometimes it's an organism, sometimes it's a model. Do you pick the ones that are hermaphrodites and the closely related species that are not? Okay, so it's a good idea to pick a pair, for example, Briggs and Nagoni, where you, you can do direct comparisons. They're very genetically similar. One's hermaphrodite, one's female. You might just say, well, what are the genetic differences between them? Maybe those are responsible for the difference in sexual reproduction. That is one answer, and people are doing that, but that's not what the authors on Wednesday chose to do. So they did pick, so they did pick one of these Cynorhabditis elegans group species to work with. Would you want to work with a hermaphrodite or a female species, or both? And so we heard both. Compare the two. That makes sense to me. The authors decided to work with Cynorhabditis romanii, which is a female species. Why would you do that? So they want to what if you start with it if you start with a herma, or for the female rather, a female Romanii, then what could you do to learn how her hermaphroditism evolves? So you can go through that repression cascade and turn it into a hermaphrodite? So you can Try messing with the genetics of a female and see if you can make a female, experimentally make a female species self-fertile. So if it's true that the common ancestor, which is not necessarily the case, I, I'm posing the argument, that if it's true that the common ancestor of all of these species was a female species, not a hermaphrodite species, and we think that's true because most of the species have females, it makes more sense that hermaphroditism evolved independently. So if it's true that these all have a, a share of female ancestor, then the evolutionary biologists argued, it seems like these organisms are all poised to really easily evolve hermaphroditism. If we see it evolve so many times over a relatively short period of time, then maybe we can do something to see Romanii to make it become a hermaphrodite. That's what we're going to read about on Wednesday, is what does it take to turn a Romanii into a self-fertile hermaphrodite? And that's why this, in my opinion, is a really cool paper. I know I'm biased because I work on these species, but that's why it made it into science. It's a pretty cool story. So we'll let Leslie tell the research story on Wednesday. Ah, uh, I forgot I put this slide in. Good thing I left myself a little bit of time. There's one sort of experiment they're going to talk about that we haven't talked about at all yet this semester, so I thought it might be worth talking briefly about it. I think most of what they're going to show, there aren't that many figures, although we'll see some supplemental figures, hopefully. And you, I encourage everybody to look at the supplemental figures, too. We'll definitely see them, I think, on Wednesday, but if you want to take the time to look them up, beforehand, that would be good. So mentioned fiddling with the sex determination cascade, the genes that are responsible for the switch between oogenesis and spermatogenesis. So here we're going to need to learn how scientists manipulate gene expression. We've seen last week, what did they do to the mice? They were making some mutants that didn't have certain Hox genes, I think. So they made transgenic mice they do that by a number of methods, but you actually remove the genes from the chromosomes of the mice so that none of the cells have the gene. No way for the animal to produce the protein that's encoded by that gene, transcription factor or whatever. That's not the technique that they use here to do genetic manipulation of these worms. 
It's not genetic engineering per se. It's a process called RNAi. Do you want to talk about this Wednesday, Leslie, or shall I do a brief intro? I'm, I'm, I'll talk about it. Okay. So, all you need to know about RNA interference for now, then, since we're going to hear about it on Wednesday, is that it's a it's a different mechanism to make sure that genes don't get turned on. It's an experimental manipulation that you make of worms, or any species, a lot of species can be RNAi'd. It stands for RNA interference, and that's all I'll say about it for now. So it's a, it's a method of keeping target genes, for example, from being turned on. So if you RNA'd something that's in the sex determination pathway, you can learn a lot about what the outcome is. If you knock down one of the FEMS, or one of the TRAS, or GOLD1, or something like that, then you can learn about its role by looking at the, at the outcome of the animals that you've exposed to this process. Did you convert a hermaphrodite into a spermless hermaphrodite or a fog feminized germline only oocytes hermaphrodite? And those are, that's the way in the 90s and early 2000s that whole cascade was worked out. All those genes involved in what their roles were, were was in part using this process. I know, it's so shocking that people are dropping their computers. <laughs> so, any questions? If not, I had a question from go for it. Ago. Yeah. Uh, Nomenclature. So there are a lot of gene names in here. Different species have different processes for naming genes. In Drosophila, you get genes that are called things like torpedo and gherkin and sisterless. They all have to, and so there's some really, sonic hedgehog, hedgehog, Indian hedgehog, desert hedgehog. In worms, there are genes, for example, just for example, since Kevin mentioned the HIM genes, HIM stands for high incidence of males. And what I didn't tell you is that in nature, in the, in the hermaphroditic species, males are really rare. Because selfing is so useful, what the hell is the point of having males around? So males occur maybe one in every thousand individuals in nature. C. Briggs, C. elegans, the selfing species. Males are really rare. And for scientists that want to work with them in the lab, it would be useful to have lots of males if we're trying to set up crosses. We don't want to have to look through thousands of microscopic worms to find males to set up crosses. So at some point, somebody discovered that you can make mutants. There are genes that control the frequency of males in the population. So you can find mutants in these genes that produce more males. So that's what HIM stands for, is high incidence of males. Senoraptitis geneticists love to come up with clever gene names that abbreviate to also clever things, like HIM for high incidence of males, the HIM genes. Though that's named for the mutant phenotype. That's not true in every species. But in Senoraptitis, if you make a mutation in a gene and you observe high incidence, high incidence of males, for example, you would call that a HIM gene. The weird logical thing here is that that means that the role of the gene itself, the normal role of the gene, is to not produce that many males. Yeah, exactly. It's the opposite logic. The, normally, this gene is there to control, is to prevent male development, essentially. So when you get rid of that protein or that gene with the mutation, then you see the effect. So it's, it's reverse logic. If it's a HIM gene, that means its normal gene, normal role is not to make males, but when you get rid of it, then you get the trait, the phenotype. And that's true for all of the genes that are in the sex determination cascade too. For example, one other one, because it's time to go. She one, one of those genes that was unique to, I don't remember which species now, she one, that was Briggsy, I think, stands for spermless hermaphrodite. S-H-E, she won. So normally this is responsible for production of sperm and hermaphrodites, but if you get rid of it, then you get spermless hermaphrodites. 
So the him mutations that they're using in final answer to your final long answer to your question is that for setting up experimental crosses, you need to find males. So it's a it's a common trick for senior abditis geneticists to use him mutants as a strain to get lots of males. So that they don't have to go searching through thousands and thousands of worms to find males to set up crosses. It's a lot less work than what we do in the lab, which is to keep males around. You just constantly.